Rob Cross, I teach at the University of Virginia and also run a consortia there called the Network Roundtable. It's a group of about 100 companies focused on applying the network lens to different issues and organizations with obviously innovation being a critical uh, component of how various organizations are trying to get better impact from collaboration. From my perspective, I come at innovation more from uh, an ability to see how and where it's happening in networks. So we've developed various approaches for looking at collaborative patterns in large, large groups inside companies or even between different organizations to see where ideas are flowing, where best practices are transferring deep inside groups you care about. You can uh, uh, make it uh, similar to maybe an x-ray or an MRI of how things are happening deep inside organizations. And so from my side, um, some of the things that I've seen, we've been at this for about a decade and a half, uh, are very uh, specific and targeted efforts to promote collaboration across uh, specific lines in organizations to see collaboration across functions, across geographies, and across technical expertise domains. Um, the thing that I've noticed most prominently is, is uh, most scientific or knowledge-based innovations have, have, have gone over the past several years. They've gotten far more complex, and so that means to get a new gene added to uh, a certain trait pool that you're trying to develop in a seed, for example, just as simple as a, a seed corn, uh, requires interactions across all sets of boundaries inside an organization, scientific domains, uh, cultural awareness of how and where you can take these seeds to market, pricing domains, things like that. And that means to me that these new product development teams or various networks don't just need to be connected internally, but to be bridging in many, many diverse ways uh, that, that yields value over time. Interesting question. So what I think is interesting from, a, again, a network perspective is the uh, many, many companies are taking an open model to innovation and trying to source ideas externally, bring in ideas, yet many, many times they don't get the ideas to the right points in the network. Um, you, you get people that are in these boundary-spanning roles uh, at their very peripheral uh, to the inner, make, inner workings of decision-making, of expertise in that network. And so what we're seeing over and over again is from a startup standpoint, that's the real cr thread that needs to be cracked. It's not just getting a good idea, but it's ensuring that your message makes it to the right expertise in these areas and the right decision makers in these areas to, to you know, get um, your innovation brought in or funded or, or you know, other, other devices like that. So I think for, for the innovators, it's a challenge around how do you get to the right points in these decision-making networks. For the big companies, it's a challenge around if you're trying to bring in a new idea, uh, whether it's through a talent process or you know a spanning process, you've got to do a lot more than just get the idea in-house. You, you've got to figure out where these interactions are happening that are either going to allow it to flourish or not and get the, the right people engaged that way. Uh, I think from a corporate perspective, let me, let me speak to that if I can for a minute, I think the biggest things that we're seeing uh, from a networking collaboration standpoint around innovation is that many, 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 many efforts to drive innovation through promoting collaboration, whether that's a, a new matrix dimension in the organization or it's a new uh, social media application or collaborative tool, many of them are failing because they're driving overload in these networks. Um, uh, people today are working to wit's end uh, just to keep up with email, let alone these different things that are getting added on in different ways. And it's creating very spiked networks in most of these places uh, around certain decision makers or certain roles or certain experts that others can't get to or get ideas through uh, on that you can visually see uh, in these networks. And so uh, from, from one perspective, I think the biggest uh, issue these organizations are challenging with is how to de-layer those networks in ways that, that in a targeted way helps to make people more flexible and adaptable so that innovation can happen, so that uh, you move beyond just getting that idea to actually getting traction on it and, and funding behind it and decisions approved uh, and, and things like that. Yeah, I very much believe so. And if I've seen anything over the past 15 years and in looking inside these companies, uh, that's by far what's happening. Um, and, and intuitively, you know it yourself. If I were to ask you the percent of your week that you spend uh, on the phone, on email, or in meetings, uh, you're likely to say somewhere around 90% or higher um, in most of these places, particularly knowledge-intensive work, uh, executive ranks, 
it's just phenomenal how collaborative activities inside and outside the organization have begun to sap all time and attention uh, in different ways. And so to me, again, it makes, you know, every strategy that's focused on trying to drive collaboration or drive innovation or best practice transfer through collaboration, it really has to first start with where can you delayer. People don't have the bandwidth to suddenly be thrown into yet another series of meetings or another collaborative application uh, and, and be successful in driving different innovative products or services. One of the other things that we've been seeing in the group over time is the importance of understanding networks, not just in terms of information flow or decision making, kind of the more instrumental aspects of these groups, but looking a little bit deeper down and seeing where uh, emotional aspects of, of life inside organizations has an effect. So as an example of that, one of the things that we've started mapping about a decade ago in these assessments is, is this idea of energy, the ability to see enthusiasm, who enthuses who, what projects enthuse who. Uh, and it sounds a little bit froofy sometimes and, and you know, uh, something an OB professor at UVA would come up with, but across decade of work and hundreds of organizations, it turns out to be incredibly predictive of where innovations are taking hold. You know, ideas are, are starting to take hold and diffuse, whether it's a cultural innovation you're trying to drive, uh, uh, a new product, a new offering project where those teams are getting traction. Uh, and so it turns out to be really, really important uh, to be thinking about, you know, this dimension and how it's built, how enthusiasm is uh, built and cultivated so that people, you know, give effort to initiatives differently. And from our work, it's not just a, a you know, a, a, a flaky idea, you know, metaphysics idea. It's very grounded in certain behaviors that people can be held accountable for and, and actually have impact culturally in places. On the counter side of that, what's been even more interesting over the past four or five years is we've started to map this idea of intimidation in groups and seeing where people hold back ideas in the context of others because they're uh, either experts that don't use their, their expertise well, uh, they're leaders that, that have uh, created a hierarchy around them. And those, those networks turn out to be wildly dense and I think it's a real challenge for people to think about as they go forward. Uh, the degree to which you may have a lot of great talent in-house, but if you've cultivated a kind of culture of fear or intimidation uh, or status in, in these regards, those ideas aren't going to make it to the table. They're not going to become uh, prominent and actually have influence in terms of different innovative offerings or services that might happen.